Welcome to Natural Resources University. This week's episode features Deer University, hosted by Bronson Strickland and Steve Damaris. Welcome to Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. I'm Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. We're both lifelong hunters, deer biologists, professors of wildlife management, and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. We explain the latest research, including our own work and that conducted elsewhere. So if you're interested in deer biology and management, this is your podcast. Every decision you make is a step in your management program, and we give you the knowledge to make every decision count. Hi there. Welcome to a Talk on the Wild Side, your bi-weekly tour of all things wild in Texas. We have a special treat for you today. We're doing a joint episode with Dear You, where we're going to talk to my colleague, Mike Cherry. But I want to throw it over to Bronson Strickland at Dear You to do a little introduction himself. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, and I, I look forward to this. Hopefully, again, it's going to be a, a good opportunity for both of us. So, uh, the Deer University listeners can get exposed to your podcast and a talk on the wild side, uh, the same for Deer University. So thank you for the opportunity. And Mike, I've been looking forward to, to having a conversation with you. You're one of those deer nuts and uh, always fun to talk to a deer nut. But um, I think what is is really interesting with you is that you have a unique perspective and you've done your, of course, now in Texas and if I remember correctly, you're from Texas originally, um, no. but you did a lot of work in the Southeast, uh, in, in Georgia and Florida, and then in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So you, you've really seen a lot of different management situations uh, and limiting factors for deer herds. So I think this is going to be interesting as we kind of compare and contrast. And Mike, um, I don't want to, to oversimplify your title. I'm probably going to butcher it here, but you're the Stuart Stedman Chair for Deer Research. Did I get that right? That is correct. All right. And Well, how are things going in South Texas? Things are good. We finally got a little rain, and so things are looking better. The deer season is upon us, so we have a lot of excited people down here in South Texas, and things are good. Excellent. We... um. Uh, I know people in, in Texas would laugh at, at what I'm about to say, but we're going through a little drought over here. Mm -hmm. it, it's a southeastern context <laughs> drought, not a not a South Texas drought. But yeah, October has been really, really dry for us. And so, Mike, you know what everybody's doing over here? We're concerned about food plots and things like that and, and getting ready for, for deer season. So that that's one of our big uh, management issues right now is overcoming lack of rainfall. But I'm sure when November rolls around, the rains will return and 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 all will be well. Um, so Mike, I, I guess the theme of this, I would love to have a conversation with you is uh, under the umbrella of comparing and contrasting uh, deer management in South Texas versus deer management in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, you have a, a really qualified and unique perspective because you've you've worked in both environments. So I, I thought I would start with something that that um, it may not make a lot of sense to people unless you've been in that environment. And that is what my former mentor and still a mentor of mine, Charlie DeYoung, is um, in that environment. He says that the deer herds really aren't density dependent. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could maybe explain that a little bit better for our listeners. What does Charlie mean by that? Sure. Yeah. So density dependence is something we think about in, in any kind of population ecology where, where we see the number of individuals within a population as that increases, the per capita resource availability decreases. And then there's mechanisms such as reproductive output or survival that feed back into the population and, and cause some slowing of the population growth rate. That's the typical density dependent response that we think about across populations. In South Texas, we don't think they're necessarily operating that way, or we think that density dependence is, is weak. And the reason we think that is, is because 
there are factors that drive those reproductive processes that are totally independent of the deer density. And so we have these situations where it doesn't really matter how many deer are on the landscape. If it doesn't rain, the fawn crop is all but lost. Uh, if, if there are a lot of deer on the landscape in a good year, then there's still plenty of forage for all of them. And the, the variation in that per capita resource availability is moving around in a margin that really doesn't matter for population growth rates. And so we have populations down here that, that boom and bust with rainfall patterns. And really it's not the only place that operates like that. I've, I've worked in a lot of different systems, as you mentioned, and in Texas is, a, is an extreme example of this, but I often have described the places I've worked as a dynamic system. And so, and I, and I really moving down here, as you were mentioning the drought in, in the Southeast, it kind of made me think about my, my changing perspective about what a dynamic system is. As you get down here, you realize there's a real boom and bust that happens. Um, and this last year, this summer was really bad. We had very little rainfall until very late in the summer. But there are places in the Southeast that operate where, where density dependence is weak or absent. And so other examples where where weather can be a major driver that is independent of how many deer are on the landscape, but weather can drive that resource availability so much that the, the number of deer responding to it is pretty inconsequential. And so we've seen that in South Florida where, where rainfall again, but it's the opposite. And in years that are too wet, they have a failure in their fawn crop. Another system where we've seen that is in North Florida where there's just an abundance of bad forage. And it really doesn't matter if you have twice as many deer, half as many deer, they're all still eating really poor forage and there's plenty of it. And so the density really doesn't affect that population growth rate. And in the third place in the Southeast, or at least the Mid-Atlantic, where we've seen a similar response is in the Appalachian Mountains. And so I used to work up there quite a bit and really it's all dependent upon acorn mass crops. And so when you have really good acorn crops, all the fawns survive and things are really good. And if you don't, then there's very low fawn survival rates. And so it's it's really a phenomenon whereby weather or some factor such as acorns, some some important resource is weakly linked to the or density. And so, mm -hmm. of course, mathematically, there's always a division by the number of individuals in a population and those resources. So you can always calculate a change in a, in a per capita resource availability. But if that change is inconsequential, that's where you see this density independence that we have down here in South Texas. So um, maybe, a, maybe a very simplified way to express this would be in, uh, in your typical Southeastern scenario, there are very reliable responses to too many animals. Mm -hmm. In other words, too many animals equals not enough food relative to the number of animals available. But in some of these other systems, you're seeing phenomenon, environmental phenomenon that may supersede the number of animals. They, they're essentially more important than the number of animals on the landscape. And those are working in concert, of course. Absolutely. Very well put, Bronson. Yeah, that, that's really what it is. If there's some external force, whether it's weather or one individual resource that supersedes that deer density and, and driving that per capita resource availability that ultimately drives reproduction and survival. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the, the big management question then, Mike, and that's probably going to drive the rest of your career is what do you do? What do you do about that? And, um, you know, as my buddy and, and y'all's buddy, Donnie Drager always says is man on, on those years that you have rainfall, you look like a heck of a good deer manager. And on the drought years, not so much, but um, so maybe we could talk about was supplemental feeding is the, you know, the genesis of that, I would say is in South Texas. That's really where it took hold and gained popularity. Um, was mainly that an attempt to smooth out the, the lack of food resources available? You could, you could add a constant to the system. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really what drives it is trying to raise the floor for those really bad years. And so you don't have that catastrophic lost cohort that you can have in a drought year. So you can you can't replace the rain, but you can absolutely make it less important by main, maintaining a more consistent resource like supplemental feed. So I think 
really to lift that floor, but also to raise the ceiling of what you can achieve in really good years is the other big motivator that people have for supplemental feeding. And it has you know, been shown by Charlie DeYoung and others to, to greatly benefit a lot of the population metrics and morphometric metrics that we use to, to identify population health. And so that those probably are the two main drivers for motivating people to use supplemental feed. Gotcha. So what role does habitat play and what are, what are proactive things that managers can do in that country? And, you know, the responses are very different. The tools are different. The responses are different. Um, I'm no Tim Fulbright, of course, but I would, I would speculate that the, the return time on managing the habitat, there's a much longer or wider window in the Southeast because rainfall is fairly reliable, except for right now, you know, within one or two years, you are, you are guaranteed a, a vegetative response. D do you ever have people undertake habitat management activities and then you've got a three-year drought and they're holding their hands up and saying, professor, what's, what's going on here? There's no response. Absolutely. So we, we've seen those kind of scenarios play out all the time. And, you know, one of the things that we always talk about in the Southeast is that first growing season following a fire, the improved forage availability, the, the uh, more palatable forage, and you're replacing a lot of hardened off woody, woody vegetation with succulent new growth. And that's very predictable because rainfall is predictable. Here in South Texas, if you burn and it doesn't rain, you don't get that response. And it could be a whole year before you get that response or, or sometimes more. And so people do undertake habitat management all the time, and, it, and it's still an essential part of any deer management program here in South Texas, but the responses are much more unpredictable based on weather patterns. I I can concur with that because uh, it's kind of like Donnie's saying, I always tell people, if you get rain after fire, you look like some kind of fire god or goddess, mm -hmm. as the case may be. And if it doesn't rain after you burn, they're cussing you, they're wanting their money back, you know, the whole thing. And you just have to go, you know, be patient, be patient. The rain will come and you will get the benefit, but you got to be really patient sometimes in South Texas. So I'm glad you brought up fire, Mike, because I want to ask you about uh, more specifically about fire. I learned about fire in the Piney Woods and uh, of course, you know, just how important it is for deer in like the East Texas Piney Woods and throughout the South, the coastal plain. And having come here, I want to, I want to ask you, it might be hard, but in the same vein of comparing and contrasting, is fire as important in the brush country for deer management as it is, say, in the coastal plain and in the Piney Woods? I think it can be. I think okay. it can be. I think it's just a lot more unpredictable in the responses. So people rely upon it less. Okay. And you also, you have circumstances here in, in brush country where you can lose your brush if you burn at the wrong time and then you lose your, your cover and, and brush diversity is incredibly important. And of course there's variation and how susceptible to being top killed different brush species are from fire. And so it's trickier. It's a mm -hmm. lot more, um, readily deployed in the piney woods where you know what's going to happen and, and nine years out of ten you get the right rain and and that sort of thing so i think it should be i think it can be but i don't think it is necessarily always as as readily utilized down here as it could be okay it's just so tricky we need we need that fire goddess to come in and <laughs> be able to put the right fire on the landscape and get the rain right well you know there's a lot of research that shows that where rainfall is more predictable the outcome of fire, the result of fire is going to be more predictable. And yeah, it's a hard sell when you can't predict the rain. So you can't always predict the outcome, the immediate outcome. Like I say, if you can wait, you will get that out. You will get that benefit, but it might not be this year or even next year if we're in a long-term drought. Um, so, well, I just lost my train of thought. We may actually have to cut. I've got a question for you, yeah, Sandra. For what mm -hmm. is, um, what's the typical scale, spatial scale of fire? So southeastern context, it's always a stand. You know, how big is the yeah. stand? 50 acres up to 500. What What's the typical scenario for the, the range lands there? Um, you know, it, it really varies, but we are kind of lucky, I guess, in that 
a lot of our landowners have larger areas of land, just have larger ownerships than say a small NIPF, you know, land in, uh, you know, a privately owned forest in the Southeast. So they might, you know, if they own 10,000 acres, they might be able to burn 2000 acres a year without it, you know, uh, being a big deal. And that might really bring them some benefit. So again, it does depend on the landowner, but I always say that we should just burn as big a piece as we can, because it almost takes me as much planning and as much effort and as much energy to burn 40 acres as it does to burn a thousand acres. So let's burn a thousand acres. If you got a thousand acres that you can spare and that you can manage and burn this year, let's do it. Let's not waste our time on 40 acres, you know? So that would be my advice to people who have large land holdings and are able to do that. I just remember what I was going to say a while ago was you brought up the brush and the response of brush One of the really tricky things in South Texas is that the brush doesn't burn under prescribed fire conditions. So a lot of times folks will call me and they'll say, you know, come on out. I've got a place I want you to look at. We want to burn it, whatever, you know, and I'm looking at it and we really need grass in, in South Texas. Grass is the fuel. That is the fine fuel that's going to carry your fire. And so where you've got brush encroachment that's sort of filled in and we don't have a lot of grass in there, your fire is just going to break apart and it's just going to piddle around in there. And, you know, I always tell people, I warn them, I'm like, you're, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be happy with the result because it's going to just, like I said, it's going to piddle around in there. It's going to break apart. We're going to have to keep lighting. And honest to goodness, a lot of folks just don't believe me until they see me try it. And then they're like, oh, okay. Well, we thought that whole thing would burn under wildfire conditions. Oh yeah. Those trees, all that brush is, is fuel under wildfire conditions. But once we've had brush encroachment, that's super thick, we can't even use fire prescribed fire, you know, uh, to manage. And that's really frustrating for landowners. And it's also frustrating for me too, because honest to goodness, sometimes they just don't believe it. Right. Yeah, and those those two things, the scale of fire and that mixed uh, severity, that heterogeneity and severity are both really important aspects when you think about deer management, because deer have relatively small home ranges, and you don't want the entire place to look the same. And so they want to have some intact cover, maybe some variation in time since fire. And so having a fire that burns through and just, you know, fingers go through and burn the grass where mm-hmm. you have, you'll have new herbaceous vegetation coming in the next year, but there's still untouched brush for thermal cover and concealment cover. That could be really good for deer. Of course, every fire manager wants to see that nice, you know, black carpet across the landscape, but that heterogeneity is really important. And one thing I think the Southeast has over our rangelands in terms of fire is that they do often burn in these 50 acre patches and these, these 200 acre patches, these, these stand level fires. And that really, that small scale fire is really beneficial for a deer's home range because it's just one portion of it. So they may still have really good fawn hiding cover in the next stand that's, you know, thick and and rank and brushy, but then they have this really nice area to go and feed Mm -hmm. in that recently burned patch. And so having, having either mixed severity or, just heterogeneity in the time since fire on the landscape based on the small patch sizes of burns that you see in the Southeast Piney Woods are both really important for, for deer management. Yeah. You know, I think that's a good point because for deer anyway, you're right. As a burn manager, I want to drive away and leave a black, just a black Mm -hmm. square on the ground or whatever shape your pasture was, but because, and I'll tell you why it's not because I just want to burn up the whole world. It's easier for me that way. (laughs) I don't have to babysit. If everything was burned, my job here is done. And I, you know, I'm going to check on it tomorrow, but I don't have to babysit for a few weeks. Okay. So that makes my life easier, but you're right. There's this sweet spot where, you you know, you have to have some brush or some woody mots or something like that. And some people are really good at this. One of our board directors, good friend of mine, Gus Canales, Gus is so good at this. He calls it a dirty burn. 
and he burns enough that he grows a lot of good grass in between his brush, but he also leaves a lot of brush then for his deer. And so there's this sweet spot where you've got enough brush that the deer have brows and that they have cover. But once it's, you know, like I'm, I'm talking about once it's just encroached and it's all closed in, I can't do anything for you with fire at that point. You got to do something else first, you know? So how do you reintroduce fire into those systems? Do you, you know, in the Southeast, a lot of times when you have a system like that, where it's, it's, it's so overgrown, you go in and the moist condition, do like a few skimming burns to yeah. get it back under control, but you need really hot fire to get in there. So how do you reintroduce fire once you've got those kind of situations? You know, what you really have to do is you have to do something mechanical first or maybe chemical, but mechan mechanical is the best way to get at it. Go in and, you know, chain or uh, root plow or aerate, roller chop something, mm -hmm. some areas um, and maybe follow up in those areas with some chemical you know, to keep that brush from coming back. And then as soon as you've got your grass growth in there where you can carry a fire, then burn those areas and, and do leave yourself that brush so that you have that uh, cover and browse for, for your deer. But yeah, you've got, you got to do something drastic first, unfortunately. It's really interesting hearing you. Uh, I, I was going to ask that same question. I was I was assuming, and I think what's fascinating here is the ecology of this. We we have a different plant community, but um, the, the ecology is similar. So, uh, like in the southeast, uh, Mike, it would be akin to having a closed canopy pine stand, and just because of needle accumulation. You could get a fire through there, but you're going to be very disappointed with the response because what is limited in that context is sunlight. And so you've got to go in mechanically with a thinning and get some of those trees out, get sunlight penetrating the stand. Now, when you add fire to that system, you're getting exactly what you want in terms of the, the return of vegetative community. So it they're they're very different but they're very similar and that it's going to require a mechanical intervention there to uh, get rid of some of the brush or in our case some of the the canopy trees to get sunlight back in the system mm -hmm. that's true but, and and sometimes landowners have to come at it you know a little chunk at a time because that's really expensive so once you've you know you've done that mechanical treatment in an area then now you use fire and you keep maintaining that part with fire and when you've got the resources, then, you know, treat with mechanics, you know, treat with roller chopping or whatever, another area, and then keep maintaining it with fire. Because like I say, there's just a sweet spot where, you know, there's not enough grass or there's not enough brush and you want to, you want something in between, I suppose. Absolutely. A third, a third example of that that's really interested me over the years is this interaction between other disturbance regimes in South Florida flooding and fire interact in some really interesting ways. And so thinking about needing to go in with mechanical uh, treatments before you can burn, this, this scenario really stuck out to me when I started working in South Florida. So they've, they've changed the hydrology there such that this sheet flow, the seasonal flooding doesn't happen like it used to happen. And so some species like cabbage palm, native species have become invasive and just erupted underneath their pine savannas. And so you have a thick mid-story of, of cabbage palm that if you go in and light that stand, the cabbage palm will basically burn so hot, you'll lose your pines, you'll lose your fine fuel inputs from the needle load, and you basically end up with a, a, a palm forest, which is not anybody's management objective. So they have to go in and, and do all this mechanical removal and clean up the cabbage palm first and then get it to burn again like a pine savanna should. Yeah, that's neat. That's interesting. I love the ecology of this that we're talking about. It's just so cool how it all fits together. How does uh, you, Sandra, you keep mentioning grass, and uh, I totally get that from a fuel perspective. Of course, on the on the deer side in the southeast, we really don't care about grass that much, and and it's a constant here. We're we're, we're always going to have it and get it. Yeah. Um, but but I do think about grass for the the country y'all are in relative to to livestock, and I was wondering what what are the the compatibilities of fire and your objectives for deer and then for livestock is there is there a trade-off there do they 
Uh, do they synergize together or how do you handle that? You know, I, I, I want to hear from Mike on that too, but um, I think, I think that they can go really well together. You know, we've had this history in South Texas of overgrazing. And if you over, you know, in the past, if you overgraze, you don't have any grass, so you don't have any fire. Um, and then you get a bunch of brush encroachment and whatever. But if you're grazing at a moderate, you know, stocking rate, at a healthy stocking rate, light to moderate, um, I think that you can use fire. You can have your deer, you know, it's you can have your cake and eat it too, really. Uh, we've got a project down on the East Foundation. East Foundation is really good at this and the and you know they figured out how to do this. And on one of their their probably their southernmost property down at El Siles near Port Mansfield, Texas. Um we've got a big burning project where we burn. We've got uh, they they range from 500 to 1200 acre plots and there are some control plots. And uh, it's a patch burning project. So there aren't fences anywhere and the cattle just come and go as they please. And so we burn, the cattle will hit that really hard and they'll, um, you know, I mean, they'll be in there when the grass is only, you know, an inch or two uh, tall and they'll give it a second disturbance that also helps keep it young and lush as it grows. And in uh, they, they've got woody moths and the, our prescribed fire goes right around those woody mots. And so I think that's probably important for the deer. And then also the fire brings back forbs. The cows really aren't interested so much in the forbs when they've got good grass. And so now we've got forbs for the deer. But what do you think about that, Mike? Yeah, you really hit on the what I was thinking about there at the end is, is good grass management with fire and grazing is going to create the forbs that deer really require. And so I think I think you absolutely can have all of that. And cattle can work synergistically with deer to create that, or with fire, I should say, to create that secondary disturbance following the fire and, and literally reduce some of the competition for forbs up by the grass. And so certainly it can help release forbs in a sense. Um, but I think, I think they're compatible land uses. The problem is finding that sweet spot that varies by, by ranch and by year and by everything else to try to maintain stocking densities that are just right because it is a mm -hmm. it's a really thin line you're trying to to balance there because at some point the cattle aren't as interested in the forbs if there's plenty of good grass but they'll eat it too and they sure. will browse and and there is really a, a lot of potential for competition which is some of the work that we're doing with the east foundation and the in the deer program is trying to understand where are those levels and how much does cattle stocking rate influence uh, deer population performance that's neat it, yeah i i think it's really um one thing that you, you mentioned is just so important. Every piece of land is different. Every landowner has his or her own unique challenges, his or her own unique property and climate. And so it's really hard to make a prescription. Like people will ask, how often should I burn it? Mm -hmm. And that's like one of the most common questions and they hate to hear it depends, but it does oh, yeah. on a whole <laughs> lot of things, you know? But yeah, that's that's really so. So you're working on cattle competition and deer. Mm -hmm. Are you what have you found so far? Yeah. So we are trying to understand how cattle and deer comp compete and what are the outcomes of competition. And so there's a, an experiment that's ongoing in the northern portion of the San Antonio Viejo Ranch where they have experimentally stocked cattle at different uh, different rotations and different densities. And so we've got deer with GPS collars that were spread across these 10 pastures that got these different treatments. And we investigated the behavioral response of that stocking event. So these were pastures that had been vacated for a few years and there were no cattle out there. And then the deer were out there and we, we, man, we basically were able to monitor the change in their niche space, more or less. So how did their behavior change? How did their resource selection change? And what we expect to be able to, to disentangle is there's really two forms of competition that could be influencing this, this, the deer herd. One is exploitative competition where cattle eat resources that deer would have otherwise had. And the other is interference competition where there's antagonistic interactions between deer and cattle. So let's, for example, like cattle are congregating around a water source that deer no longer have access to. And so it's through these, inter in these antagonistic interactions. 
And so we looked at their behavior immediately following this stocking event where they the cattle didn't have time at these relatively low stocking densities to influence forage availability in a meaningful way. And we, we measured that with a few different uh, techniques. But we did see immediately this response in behavior. So they shifted their habitat selection and they they started to move differently across the landscape. Huh. And so that was really a, a, a very short study where we looked at the immediate response following the stocking event. But then we scaled out and we have several years of data where we do these annual captures every year where we catch around 500 deer a year across uh, four or five of their properties that's so impressive what you guys do it, it's amazing we're actually right in the midst of it right now and so the whole team is extremely uh exhausted Tired. and worn out <laughs> and and just uh, neck deep in good data but we, we've been monitoring these deer populations and we collect a lot of uh, measurements like uh, lactation rate and antler size and body mass and we measure uh, rump fat deposition with an ultrasound. And so we get all these different measures of, of nutritional condition and population performance. And we link those back to soil, you know, sandiness of the soil, uh, rainfall patterns, uh, amount of brush on the landscape, and then stocking rates. And so we're just now starting to uncover some of the effects of stocking rates on these their population indices. Cool. So you mentioned, I, I have a dumb question for you. That's kind of my thing. I ask the dumb questions. <laughs> um, you mentioned lactation rate. How do you measure lactation rate? Is that just lactating or not lactating? It, it is. So that, okay. that's a really coarse measurement of reproductive activity in deer. Okay. It's not related to litter size. It's not related to fawn survival ultimately, but it gives us some sense of, of reproductive activity in adult deer and the uh, some early weaning. So they at least had fawns long enough that, that we can still see see uh, lactation when we are when we're handling those animals in October. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. It, it's pretty insensitive. So when lactation rates are normal, things are probably okay. But when lactation rates are really, really no, you know you have a problem. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they, yeah, the whole litter size, yeah, the, the, the doe have one fawn or two fawns. So you can have a big swing and variation in recruitment with little change in the lactation index. But it's so popular because hunters can collect that data. Oh, okay. And so that, that's kind of why it's entrenched at the skinning shed is that we can, hunters can see it and mark it down and, and we have a pretty good index. Yeah. And one of the places I see the most value with it is looking at your early age classes. So if you're looking at yearling lactation rates, that means that animal is able to breed as a fawn, which is indicating a really good habitat quality. And so that metric can move around a little bit more than you would see at like your five-year-old does. So it has, it has a lot of utility, but it's really coarse and you need to catch like 500 deer a year, or harvest a lot of deer to try to get that index to really reveal anything about the system. Okay. What do you typically see, Mike, for that yearling doe lactation rate? What is Almost common? Zero. Yeah, down here, very, very rarely do we see it. And so, you know, when I worked at the Jones Center, which is, you know, in South Southwest Georgia, exceptional country. It's got you know, 10 to 15 percent of the landscape in food plots and 50 percent of it's burned every year on a two year cycle. Just really perfect deer country. And they they have, you know, 40 percent in their yearly lactation rate. So and that's really, wow. really good. That means most of, like a good number of their fawns are actually mm -hmm. breeding at their first year. Oftentimes they're breeding late, so they don't ovulate with the main rut but they'll ovulate in subsequent ruts interesting so following along this ovulation and lactation line i think some of your work has been on fawn recruitment maximizing fawn recruitment can you again can we compare and contrast fawn recruitment and how we maximize it in the south texas brush country as opposed to the piney woods yeah so i think there's a few things to think about that are the same no matter where you are. Okay. And so really the easiest thing to manipulate to affect how many fawns are gonna recruit into the population is how many does do you have on the landscape? And so doe harvest is the number one thing. It's the easiest thing to manipulate and it's the biggest driver ultimately is how many does do you have in the population who are reproductively active this year? That's where you should always start. Harvest is the, is the easiest place. Um, then you start thinking about, okay, given the fawns that we produce this year, how do we maximize their survival? And there are people usually think about things like predator control or habitat manipulations. I think creating adequate fawning cover 
in pr close proximity to good feeding grounds for the does is the real secret solution. I think that's really what what drives everything is trying to make make it easy for does. So, you know, really healthy individuals, they don't take nearly as many risks. They're much more successful moms, and those are the ones that are going to provide you your fawn crop. And so, make maintaining high levels of nutrition for your females throughout all of gestation. So through the winter and going into the fawning season. And then during that, that first month of lactation, which is really the peak energetic investment across mammals, but particularly for deer, maintaining adequate nutrition there so they don't have to make these risky decisions to try to meet their energetic needs. That's the key to it. So habitat management that maximizes a doe's nutritional state and provides the fawn adequate fawning cover would be the recommendations whether you're in South Texas or, or in the Southeastern United States. Here in South Texas, that gets really complicated because we often have droughts and we often have just a, a, a lack of, of forage available for deer, for does because of a drought. And so that's where people start to think about things like supplemental feed so that those females have the energy that they need, the dietary requirements that they need during that final trimester where like 80% of the fawn's development is occurring and that early life lactation period where really predation risk is at the peak, energetic demands are at the peak. Maintaining does nutritional condition at that time is, is incredibly important. And so the techniques to doing that are different in different places. Like here, we rely more on a, growing our plants somewhere else, pelletizing them and bringing them to South Texas, where in Bronson's country, they just grow the plants right there in the forest that they're trying to manage. Okay. So, but the, the mechanisms are the same. It's just the tools are slightly different. I got you. Okay. So instead of a food plot, it's supplemental feed. It's supplemental feed. Interesting. Yep. And then in, when you think about food plots, um, you know, well, a lot of people have interest in food plots that are based on uh, providing harvest opportunities, you know, growing okay. something that's going to be available late in the year. Uh, and that's really not that, that's not beneficial to, to maximizing your fawn crop. It's which not. You, you want to have something in the, early growing season and throughout the summer and making maintaining that two season food plot would be really important but maintaining your harvest plots is very important too for a whole other host of reasons but these nutrition plots in the summer is absolutely the key and there are people you know down in the valley who are utilizing food plots in that in that capacity as well and in sort of um the eastern edges of south texas you see more of that okay so this two season food plot um it, is that something you have to plant twice or is there a plant you can use that that will get you through those two seasons no it's typically two different two different crops okay. yeah so you'll have something that's nutrition based through the antler cycle and the fawning season in the mm -hmm. summertime and and then you'll have something like a green patch of uh, wheat oats rye something like that that allows you to maximize your harvest opportunity in the winter okay that makes sense so um that, that was a, a a good question mike i wanted to follow up on that is um what do you see as on the properties you visit you visit um you obviously own some properties that are very very successful uh with with trophy buck production what do you see as the biggest mistakes so if if like you could reach uh the most people with you know here's number one number two number three What's kind of your advice for what are some things that they can do that they would see a benefit from? Well, that's a great question, Bronson. I've, I've, I've thought a lot about that and I've gone to a lot of these, these premier deer ranches in the last few years and, and you, you ride around and you talk to their managers and then they ask you what we should be doing. And it's, you know, you guys are already pretty well got this figured out. So a lot of times I don't have a lot to offer. It's more really about optimization of their program. So what can they stop doing that may not really be that big of a benefit? And and what should they maybe increase a little bit? But there's still a lot. Of, we have a lot of questions about the timing of resources and how important that is. Uh, so a lot of a lot of people will supplementally feed throughout the year. And, and like, like I was just talking about during the summer, it's really important maintaining your uh, your antler development, maintaining your fawn development, but then they'll switch to corn in the in the fall. And so, and that's really just a function of trying to maximize the you know, harvest ability. Um, and that's really effective for that. But I, I have a lot of questions about 
the timing of resources and how important it is. And so from the livestock world, we know that the condition of a female at ovulation is incredibly important to the offspring's outcome. And so we, we take away this more balanced food that we give them throughout the year and replace it with a high energy food, which is probably what's lacking most in our environment down here is energy. And so they get that from the corn, but we've removed a lot of the protein. And so their condition at ovulation is not maximized necessarily. So we pull the rug out from under them and switch them over. And so while we don't have a lot of data on this from the deer world, I do wonder how timing of resources influences that outcome for offspring. And if we're getting all that we could, and if, if we really want to maximize the quality of our mature bucks for harvest potential later, maximizing doe condition at ovulation, at maximizing the fawns that are coming into their first winter. There's so much information from the livestock world about fetal programming and the importance of those first few weeks of gestation. And we just don't have that information in the deer world. It's, it's things that we're chasing in, in our research program now. But that's one thing that I think about a lot is just the timing of resources. When do the bucks need it for antler growth? When do the fawns need it to maximize their growth patterns? And, and when do the does need it to be in the best possible condition at ovulation? Yeah, we, we've had a, um, you know, perfect world with unlimited money and time and all that. We would love to replicate this and run the studies a lot longer. But, you know, we, we found a lot of evidence for what you're describing, Mike, with that fetal programming or an epigenetic effect. And, uh, and, and the thing that I thought was most interesting is that it's an intergenerational relationship. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, so it's not what you eat, what you eat is important, but you're also influenced by what your mother ate and what her mother ate. And so that's those stress and hormonal cues that are passed to that developing fetus. And at least what we think is that that is affecting the expression. So you're not changing the, the genes, of course, but you're affecting what genes are expressed. And that's all accomplished with, with nutrition and the, and the, timing of nutrition as you expressed. And I often, Mike, you, you'll hear people say that, uh, you know, what supplemental feed did for the deer herd. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to always not correct, but change the conversation. It's not what supplemental feed did. It's what nutrition mm -hmm. did. And you offered it in the form of supplemental feed, but you could accomplish that same effect with a whole bunch of different forms of, of nutrition. It could be through habitat management. It could be through agriculture and food plots. And in some circumstances, supplemental feed, but it's all nutrition. Absolutely. That's something that we've been thinking a lot about too, following up on some of your work and trying to understand how DMPs produce the way that they do. And, and so for, for folks across the country who don't know about this DMP program in Texas, it's it's legal to put 15 or 20 does in a five acre pen with a desirable sire and allow them to pull uh, or to breed all of those females and then you release them the subsequent year. And we do see responses. They're, they're certainly growing large deer through this program. And we have the question, how much of this is genetics? You know, obviously we're selecting sires, but we have no control over selecting the females, at least in that first generation. And how much of it is this condition where you're putting them in a, on an ad libitum diet in a small environment with no predators and limiting their their energetic expenditures uh, so we're trying to figure out how much of that is the actual genetics versus this environmental cues the epigenetics if you will from those from those processes and, and trying to understand which which is well really what they're both contributing how much are they both contributing yeah that's, that's so cool. interesting i never thought about the fact that in that dmp pen yeah there's no predators and they're being fed every day and they don't have to expend much energy so yeah, that, that's that's that would be cool if you guys could figure that out. We're working hard at it. <laughs> you, you you can grow big deer in, in deer pens when those bucks don't have to worry about anything else. That's true. They they even have a, a veterinarian at disposal if if they get sick. So it's a lot different when you're out there in the brush country or the piney woods and you have to fend for yourself. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah you know, so, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say it. It amazes me that these epigenetics are multi-generational and, and we've heard this before we interviewed a, a shark guy who had found the same thing but so so for folks 
I guess folks need to understand that their investment, they might not see the payoff of their investment this year or even next year, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so it could take some time to to change that programming. And so what, what epigenetics really seeks to do is match the phenotype, the phenotypic expression, the trait, the variation in traits to the environment. And so it's trying to match that. And it takes a while to change that. And so uh, some of these traits that are not optimal for our desires, are they may be optimal for survival. In other words, it may not always be good to be big with large antlers. That's what we want, but that may not be what the environment is calling for. And so if you are from an environment that has demonstrated that you have higher reproductive output or survival with a different body design, it can take a generation or two to see that response where it says, okay, this is a more consistent environment. I can invest in these secondary luxury traits, these antlers. And, and that can allow to, it, that, or that can require, I should say, a couple of generations to actually see that effect. Interesting. Ecology is interesting. I know, right? Evolution's interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just why you can't, you can't fix these problems. And Mike's familiar with the Southeast and, you know, generations before us were, you know, we'll just populate these areas with, with, with Wisconsin deer or Minnesota deer. And, you know, lo and behold, uh, after a generation, you don't have a Wisconsin deer <laughs> in Georgia or Alabama or Mississippi because they have to match their phenotype has to match the environment that they're in. So now they have to deal with this pesky EHD. So a lot of them die from that. And, and then you look at it's probably from a heat dissipation standpoint. Mike, not advantageous to be in South Florida and weigh 300 pounds mm -hmm. that, you know, there's some serious physics and ecology going on there. And that that's why we see this regional variation so much is the, the context, the environmental context that that deer has to live in. And, you know, food is one of those, but also heat conservation and dissipation could be another one. Okay. So dumb question again, EHD, this is heat dissipation. What's the E? Hemorrhagic disease, blue tongue or epizootic hemorrhagic disease. It's very, very common in Texas and the Southeast. Oh, okay. Not so common up North. Okay. Yeah. They but when deer up North are confronted yeah. with that virus, they don't have the antibodies or anything. And so you'll see a much larger die off. Okay. So you might have 50% of your deer die in Illinois and that same virus may kill less than 5% in Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Bronson, one thing that we're doing in our DMP studies that's that's probably of interest is, you know, we, we're, we understand that they do grow larger antlers. And that's by design. We're selecting sires based on that. But we're, we're trying to understand the trade-offs there. And so thinking about the mismatch in your environment, all that fetal programming taking place in a five-acre pen what does that mean for your survival over the, when you are released into the wild, are you going to have as high of a survival probability as a pasture born fawn? And we know from reintroduction, soft release reintroduction programs that typically pin raised quail don't have the same survival as wild birds. And so we're, we're trying to ask that question. Are there trade-offs for growing these larger antlered individuals? Do they have the same survival probability because they have been programmed for a totally different environment that they're ultimately going to grow up in that will be some fascinating results mm -hmm. that is that'll be very very interesting and mike uh i remember years ago stuart stedman who you know quite well he uh just study on the faith ranch um he released he wrote a, a document and i don't remember the, the title but it was like uh my rules for supplemental feeding or what to expect when you start a supplemental feeding program and something that that really stuck with me, because I think it's the culmination of all the things we're talking about, is the, the constant good nutrition and time, an epigenetic response. But I know he mentioned that you need to give it a decade, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, two generations in a decade is really what it takes. And uh, not so much in Texas, but in the southeast, I, I, I think people don't understand the investment and the long-term investment that's required with this type of program, because what you literally have to do is you have to have a significant change in 
diet quality for the population of deer that you're managing. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a feeder or two here and there. You're raising the diet quality of the entire population. And then the response time may be a decade <laughs> before you see it. But uh, we, we spoke, Mike, with, with Harry Jacobson on the podcast a month or so ago. And uh, it, it was really interesting because he was recounting all of these experiences where people did that and waited a decade. And he was just like, it, it, it really does work, but it really does take a long time. And so I try to just to always remind our listeners not to have any misgivings of this. This is not a Band-Aid or an instant response. It, it's going to take a long time, but it does work. Absolutely. And I, I think that that's really the key is, is nutrition and epigenetics. And people are really quick to go to how do we improve our genetics of our herd? And can we, can we bring in deer with better genetics or can we call our way to better genetics? And I think you're a lot better off thinking about nutrition and epigenetic triggers than you are manipulating genetics through harvest. Hmm. Could not agree more. And I think the Comanche Ranch study is going to to show that. There, there will be the proof right there. Absolutely. That's really interesting. I keep saying that. That's really interesting. Well, Mike, here's something I say quite often. And um, and please feel free to disagree with me because I'm a lifelong learner and uh, I'm always open to being to being educated. I have always said to to people in the southeast that, you know, they watch a, a hunting program, reading a, you know, hunting magazine. And, and of course, you're going to have a, a lot of really big deer from South Texas. And people always gravitate, typically gravitate towards, man, those genetics in Texas. It's just amazing, those genetics in South Texas. And my response, and some people will nod their head and some people just don't believe what, <laughs> what I'm saying is that there's nothing special about the genetics in, in South Texas. It is the way the land is managed and really, really large land holdings allow the buck age structure to get to an extent to where you are only harvesting the right-hand side of the bell-shaped curve, that 5%, 3%, 1%. These are very, very rare bucks that even in South Texas standards are being produced, but they're allowed to get to six, seven, or eight years of age and they're harvested. If you go back and look at the average mature South Texas buck and the average Georgia or Mississippi buck, they're pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. It's just that you can manage for and harvest the outliers in South Texas. Now, do you agree with that? I would love a spirited debate with you, Bronson, but I think you're spot <laughs> on. I think that's exactly right. And I think the evidence is in not only the averages that you mentioned, but South Texas deer have been used to restock a lot of the southeastern United States. And so and they do not look like South Texas bucks after a few generations. <laughs> and so I absolutely agree. It's age structure and it's the scale of the landscape. It's just allowing more of the animals to meet their their genetic potential. And that's absolutely why so many great bucks come out of South Texas. Yeah. I love this message, you guys. Uh, so could we say, you know, to a landowner who can't afford a $50,000 buck that, you know, he or she can really manage well with fire, with grazing, with these other tools at their, uh, you know, at, at their, uh, ready that they could you know in a decade or so like like Stuart says get there without that fifty thousand dollar buck or something i mean is that what we're saying absolutely, absolutely. okay I, I would add sandra with uh with sufficient time okay and so I'm one way i like to you know we've all had stats classes so <clears throat> normal distribution and bell curve all that makes sense to us but sure. another way to look at it from a, a management perspective is to, to get one of those five percenter bucks, which wherever you're at, they may be 170 inches or 180 inches. Th that, that means you need to produce, you know, a hundred mature bucks. And of those 100 mature bucks, two or three of them 
are going to be these really big, these big giants. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to think about your context, your deer population, the number of does you have, as Mike said earlier, how many buck fawns are you producing? And you can kind of get more of a spreadsheet approach to it if you have enough time. So good things will happen, good nutrition, age structure, and a number of generations for the number of buck fawns and uh, the, the number of generations you have to allow the stats to work in your favor. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still going to take a lot of input of money, of course, and energy. Absolutely. You can spread it out more over time than just this one, this one really big investment. Absolutely. And I think that's definitely the way to go. It, it would be thinking about spreading it out over time. And, and Bronson's spot on. If, if you're thinking about shooting one of those top one or two percent bucks, that's why a lot of people carry so many deer in their properties here is they want to, you know, instead of that scenario being 100, make it 300. And now I've yeah. got six of these bucks oh, I can okay. shoot this year. <laughs> and that, that affects you in terms of your feed bill and sure. things like that. But it, it absolutely is the driver is making sure that you have the time and the conditions right and and part of it is it's not just the conditions of that of this year and so antlers are a really true reflection of nutritional condition for this growing cycle and how they came out of winter last year but it's also affected by that early life condition that programming we were talking about and so when you can have a, a buck that is seven years old and it's a wet year and seven years ago was also a wet year that's going to maximize their potential. And so really it takes time. It takes time and you want to try to link up and allow those, those fawns that are coming out of that really nice cohort to reach maturity. Yeah. Allow your investment to mature. Yeah. yeah. Like you would any investment. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you guys, I know there are young people who are listening to the two of you talk about your careers in deer who are just, who would just give their left hand probably to have your career. Do you have advice for young folks who would, who would like to have a career like yours? Sure. Yeah. I, I think about how I got to this position and I'm, I'm really fortunate. I had really great mentors that showed me along and, and, and my uh, advisors in graduate school were Bob Warren and Mike Connor. Bob was a professor at UGA, the University of Georgia, and, and uh, Mike Connor's a scientist at the Jones Center. And they gave me a ton of good advice. And, and one of the pieces of advice that they gave me, and this isn't specific to, to the deer world, was, you know, going after a PhD, trying to become a research scientist, is it's hard no matter what you do, but chase something that you're really curious and passionate about. So then when you're really plugging away in those late hours and working hard at it, it's, it's, it's not as bad. It's not as hard. You're still motivated by the work. And so really following your passion is important. I think um, I had one other piece of advice that came from a colleague that uh, not nearly as close as, as my advisors, but a guy named Joel Brown, who's an evolutionary ecologist. And, you know, he, we had him down at the Jones center and we were doing some field work together. And he told me, he, he said, you know, science is a social phenomenon among humankind. And I, and I thought a lot about that. And, and this is a, an interesting, interesting thing to think about because we're always obsessed with the bell shaped curve and the numbers and the right study design and, and controls. But, but a lot of it is the social side of it, the networking, building the teams that you're excited to get on the conference call with, avoiding the people who you dread getting on the conference call with. And so really thinking about the social side of it is really important. Be a good colleague, come through on time, do your part, be a good friend in the way that you work, help elevate people. And so I thought a lot about that, that piece of advice, which was really just an offhand comment as we were walking through the Longleaf Pine one day, but it really stuck with me. And, and I think it's, um, it's something I've said to a lot of people is, 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 you know, nurture your network and, and be a good colleague. And I think it'll, it'll, it'll pay dividends. Oh, I love that. I mean, we I do too. We hear a lot about networking, of course, that's good advice, but, but being a good colleague, you know, I don't hear a lot of people say that. And it is so important. So important. What about you, Bronson? Well, that, that I think what Mike said is perfect and I completely agree. And, and Bob Warren, you know, when I was an undergraduate, gosh, I, hard to think of anyone better than Bob Warren in terms of giving advice and being a mentor. He was such a professional um, 
Well, one thing I remember that helped me, I mean, it literally changed the trajectory of my, my life and my career was my advisor was Larry Marshington. And he uh, twisted my arm to get out of my comfort zone and go work on this internship on the Faith Ranch in South Texas. And, uh, you know, at that point in my life, I thought I was always going to be in the Southeast. And, you know, I, I guess I am to some degree. Um, but, but that was um, so important for me because I started building, Mike, that, that network of people. And then I got out of my comfort zone, went and worked on a ranch, and I met this fellow named Charlie DeYoung. And uh, later in life, a project came open at Texas A&M Kingsville. And so I was able to become a student of Charlie DeYoung. And I, I look back on those days of how such a different system ecologically of what I was used to. Um, and it just, you know, changed the way I, I think and understood deer management. And then I still have colleagues today that I still work with because of that network, Mike, at, at A&M Kingsville. And so um, I, I couldn't agree more. I guess I'm just uh, agreeing with Mike and that those things are important. You know, go after something you love to do. If you love doing it, doing it, it's not so much work. And then surround yourself by people that are your friends and you trust and they're going to build you up and compliment you. And that's kind of the, the keys to a good career. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice from both. I love the advice to get out your, of your comfort zone and not just, not just like emotionally and mentally your comfort zone, but go new places, even if it is just temporary. I think right. um, I, uh, for, for me personally, I learned fire in the piney woods and then I went up to the high plains and now I'm down here in South Texas and it's a very different animal at all three places. And I am so grateful for the, for those experiences that I have, because I know it makes me a better fire manager and a better fire ecologist. And I just understand fire better because of, you know, being able to work in those different ecosystems. So I think that's great advice. And even, you know, you don't have to stay somewhere forever, but you know, go someplace new and, and, and learn what you can learn there. I had an aha moment that's related to fire and deer mm -hmm. and going to new systems. And yeah. so I was trained in fire ecology and deer ecology in the Longleaf Pine systems in the upper coastal plain of Georgia. And everything was about small patch size mosaic burns and, and making sure a deer in their home range has two or three different ages, time since fire that they can pick from. Sure. And main, maintaining that diversity, everything's about diversity. Never let the, the, you know, the table go empty, so to speak, for a deer's food. And I moved to Virginia and I started working there and I was working with the Forest Service and they were putting these enormous burns in the landscape. And, and, and I was just like, you can't, you can't burn 5,000 acres side of a mountain. And this isn't going to be any good for deer. They're not going to have any fawning cover for a year and you're going to lose a cohort. And I went out and saw these burns and started walking through them. And I was like, oh, oh, there's this whole other element that's driving this heterogeneity that creates different times since fire topography, which yeah, I, I had no experience right. with fire and topography, <laughs> but you'd have aspect and topography that would totally change the way the fire behaves such that a deer's home range still had three or four different times since yeah. fires within it. And just going to that new system changed my thinking entirely about scale of fire. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great example. Great example. Yeah. So I have a question for you. This is our favorite question. We love to ask our guests for a biology blunder. And I can imagine with, you know, working with deer, capturing 500 at a time or whatever, things go wrong. Do you have any time when something went wrong that that was kind of funny? Well, this is a, a very competitive list as I reflect on the, on the career. <laughs> no shortage of blunders. And there's a shortage of blunders that resulted in fun stories. But sticking with the theme of uh, deer and fire today, I, I thought about one and I was working on the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge in South Florida, trying to understand how Florida Panther recovery was influencing deer population dynamics and it was this long-term study we were doing and we were catching deer in all kinds of ways we caught deer with helicopters primarily but our sample was very biased towards the open places the big open prairies and marshes where we could use the helicopters and so we were supplementing that capture effort with darting and rocket netting that we could tuck into smaller openings or, or deep in the forest 
and I had a whole new crew of people come down that I was training on how to how to restrain deer in the in the rocket nets and and get them untangled and and uh, process the deer, and we pick a couple people to sit in the blind and tell them, okay, when the deer get on on the bait, you're gonna pull this trigger, the net's gonna go over the deer, and then you bust out of the blind and go jump on whatever deer is closest to the edge that you think is closest to getting out. If there's a big group of deer, hold the one that's closest. Uh, but everybody go restrain a deer and we'll be there. We'll, we'll hear the rockets go off and we'll be there 30 seconds later and a truckload of people will come and help. And everything goes as planned, right? Right before dark on Friday afternoon, the uh, the rockets go off and I'm excited so I can maybe go home this weekend, get these people trained and leave the study site for once. And I go flying up in the truck and I get to the group of people who are supposed to be laying on the deer and they're all just running through the prairie. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? Get, get back on the deer. And, and I hadn't noticed that the rockets had, had landed in the dry grass and started a fire that was spreading away from the deer, thankfully, but it was spreading relatively quickly considering it was five o'clock and the whole fire crew had left for the week <laughs> and there was nobody left on the refuge to call. And this is a system that is pretty famous for wildfires. And, flammable. Yes, very <laughs> flammable. And so we had a, a really quick um, dance where we're all stopping out <laughs> the fire by hand. And some of us were trying to hold deer down to make sure that they were, you know, susceptible to the fire. And, and uh, ultimately everything worked out. No deer were harmed in the making of the story. And we were able to put out the fire and no, no one was the wiser. Um, but that, that's, uh, that's what I thought of that was somewhat on theme for this, for this episode. Oh, definitely. That's a great story. I've done that dance myself. I didn't have to hold deer down at the same time though. So, yeah. I, I don't have one as good as, as Mike. Um, in fact, Sandra, I was thinking one of my biggest blunders and, and there's really no lesson here. <laughs> it, it's that bad. There's there doesn't there's, have to be a lesson. Not at all. May, maybe maybe the lesson is uh, stuff is always going to happen and forgive yourself. But absolutely, I think back professionally, one of the biggest goofs I made was um, I, I would call it not a biology, uh, but but an outreach mistake. And I was uh, in charge of a big outreach event, a seminar series, and typically, as you know, you'll you'll get sponsors for those to help defray the cost of the meal and printing and all that sort of stuff. And so I'm, I'm up on stage and getting ready to kick off the, the seminar series. And not only did I get the name of the sponsor wrong in my mind, as I'm running through of who, who it is, I recommended the competitor oh my goodness. of the people that were sponsoring and while it's coming out of my mouth and so you can just imagine the the emotions and hormones i'm on stage in front of what a hundred or so people and i see the sponsor in the back of the room get out get up and walk out and slam the door and all this is running through my head and and they're like oh my gosh i got that wrong and so uh uh, got the seminar going and went and apologized. And then uh, at lunchtime, I revealed my mistake and, and basically just fessed up and said, I'm a human. I got it wrong. My apologies. Here's the sponsor. And I guess the good part was by the end of the day, because of everyone laughing at me as they should, um, it ended up drawing more attention to the sponsor and more people went up and talked to the sponsor afterwards about that Strickland guy. What an idiot, you know? <laughs> and, and so, yeah. Yeah. It generated a lot of conversation. So it ended up working out. Okay. But that was a blunder. <laughs> oh my God. That would be mortifying. I it, mean, just it was, mortifying. <laughs> <laughs> but it all worked out. It all yeah. worked out. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. I'm glad they were forgiving and I'm glad you were able to yeah. fix it, make it, make it work for them. That's great. But, that, that is actually a pretty funny story, Bronson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I was the butt of the joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. Mike, do you have anything else you'd like to share with us today? Um, I don't, Sandra. Okay. That's fine. I'm happy to talk about anything. Bronson, do you have any more questions? No, no more questions. Just a comment. Uh, appreciate what y'all are doing 
there with, with this podcast. And Mike, of course, uh, enjoy your work and all the work out of the Institute down there. And uh, just great to talk to you. Great to have this conversation. And I really enjoyed it. This was a fun conversation and I learned a lot about deer. Um, and I want to say, I, I want to thank Bronson publicly. Uh, Bronson, when we were writing this grant to the Harvey Weil Sportsman Conservationist Award of the Corpus Christi Rotary Club, which is who funded us. Uh, Make Bronson, sure you get your sponsor yeah, right. That's there. right. I got it right. <laughs> I got it right. And it's kind of a mouthful. Um <laughs> Bronson wrote a letter for us, and it, and I also have to say, in addition to the letter, Bronson, you were just were an inspiration. You know, it's like okay, if another academic can do this, I can do this too. I can figure it out too. So, um, we've re- enjoyed the Dear You podcast over the years, and it, uh, it's a great podcast. And thank you for the inspiration and the letter. Absolutely, always happy to help. Uh, it was a big help. Thank you so much, both of you. Hope you have a a great afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. We thank the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation and the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowed financial support of our efforts. We also thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. If you have questions or suggestions, please log on to msudeerlab.com and click on the Deer University tab.